But we are uh, extremely fortunate today to have an Aaron Levinsky presenting to us. He, he's one of the world's leading behavioral neurologists and uh, s s sort of Mr. Epilepsy. Um, and uh, he's professor of neurology, neurosurgery, and psychiatry at NYU, director of the Comprehensive Epilepsy Program, written widely on, on, on behavioral neurological topics. Um, including sort of standard standard texts in, in the field, but but as I said, above all else, is is Mr. Epilepsy. So as you can see from the title, it promises to be an extremely interesting presentation, and uh, we are greatly looking forward to it. Welcome, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I feel like I'm coming home as I was. Uh, talking to some of the folks, I realized when I was in medical school as I got there, I initially thought I'd probably end up in psychiatry and college had read huge amounts of Freud and Jung. And in my first semester of medical school, I took a dream interpretation elective. And in my second semester, I uh, did two electives. One was hypnosis at Mass General, which was a practical, practical course in learning how to do it. And the other was a one-on-one -on -one tutorial with Norman Gashman. I had uh, written to him at the end of the first semester, and he had a course called The Neurology of Behavior. Uh, he was a PAC course in one of the large amphitheaters at Harvard Medical School. Uh, it was an incredible scene where you get uh, people from MIT, the Chomsky linguists, uh, you get anthropologists from Harvard, uh, and it would be packed, and at the end he would kind of hold court and have debates with people, uh, which was a remarkable thing. And I, as a medical student, I realized that if I Took this as an elective. There was no, there was no credit. It was just an open lecture course, and I would probably not do as much reading and work in it because I'd have all my regular other coursework to do. So I asked him if I could meet with him and write a paper or do something and get credit for the course. And he wrote back and said, "You know, be in my office Friday at three o'clock." And so for a whole semester, I got to uh, meet with him for an hour a week, and it was probably as good an experience as I as I have ever had in my life. And, definitely steered me in the direction of neurology, but I think he, as much as anyone, respected that uh, there is no real distinction uh, whether you deal with pain in neurology, schizophrenia and psychiatry, you may be dealing with more of the other side than your own side. So I want to talk about the limbic system, which is a place, I think, where psychiatry and neurology definitely meet and interact on a daily basis. And we'll take you through a brief history of where the concept comes from, Paul Broca, who uh, I think is well known to everybody for the uh, person who first introduced the concept of left hemisphere language uh, as an accepted thing, although it was very widely uh, suspected before that by different individuals, and certainly that langu language uh, expression is in the frontal lobe. But Broca also described a ring of gray matter in his dissections that basically encircled the brainstem and kind of was a middle ground between the outer cortex and the deeper subcortical nuclei. And so when he first described the limbic system, it was not in any way related to emotion. It was just an anatomical ring, uh, kind of a distinctive thing that fits in between these two places of the subcortex below and the higher cortex above. And that's essentially where it's evolved in our own thinking. Uh, the limbic system provides the critical connections between the cerebral cortex, which does the thinking part of our brain and the higher cognitive functions, and the lower regions uh, with which it's deeply connected. The major step forward for limbic activity and understanding what the limbic system did came in 1937 uh, with Pace. And he had observed in uh, monkeys and other animals that had gotten rabies, that there were incredible changes in emotional behavior, including aggressiveness, fighting, essentially what was thought of as an animal psychosis, related to infection that was peaking in limbic regions. And so based on that, and based on the incredibly intense emotional changes associated with rabies, which is notable as one of those remarkable viruses like the common cold, that modifies the host behavior to fulfill self-replication. Self so when you have a cold, you're not sick enough that you're stuck in bed. You're sick enough you can go outside and sneeze 
can spread the virus, which is what the virus wants. When you have rabies, uh, you are induced to aggressive acts like fighting, and the virus uh, has managed to find a way to have high concentrations of itself in limbic areas such as the hypothalamus and such as the amygdala, which will induce aggressive behavior, and also in your salivary glands, so it can be spread effectively. So based on that observation, he came up with the idea that these regions, originally described as part of Broca's circuit, the hippocampus, mammillary bodies, and hypothalamus, the anterior thalamic cortex, the cingulate gyrus, and the amygdala, which are all strongly interconnected, and many of them recipro reciprocally, uh, have a primary function in emotional activity. Paul Yakolev, who uh, had one of the best collections of brains ever uh, put together back in 1949, shortly afterwards, added two critical structures, the septum, uh, which is an important area of cholinergic activity uh, and regulation of a lot of uh, social emotional functions on a lower level if you leave in that area. In rats, depending on where you do it, you can have them totally want to avoid other animals. Uh, if you lesion the lateral septal nucleus, the opposite uh, one, you can actually get rats that are so desperately in need of social contact, they will go up to cats and get killed just to be near another animal. So these are areas in the brain that can modify deep feelings that we have. And as we all know, and I'm trying to get to this more, that subcortical regions, whether limbic or, or even below in the hypothalamus and probably brainstem, can dramatically affect behavior. And the amazing thing about uh, our brain, and especially the left hemisphere, is it's incredibly effective at rationalization. Uh, whatever behavior you do, you may not know why you do it, but you have no problem explaining it. And we'll get to that later. Uh, one of the beautiful things about being human. Uh, and then the nucleus accumbens here, which is really where the uh, caudate and putamen come together very inferiorly um, and then very close to a lot of other um, critical uh, nuclei that are related to limbic functions as well, very inferiorly there. Uh, and it's obviously the place that receives the large dopaminergic projection from the ventral tegmental area, so the substantia nigra goes to more the caudate and putamen but the ventral segmental area of the midbrain projects here to the nucleus accumbens. These are different dopamine receptors. These are the ones that are much more thought to be involved in disorders like psychosis. Um, he added that to the limbic system back in 1949, and at that point, it really <coughs> kind of had its modern conception as an important set of emotional structures, strongly interconnected, but also serving overall as a bridge between the cortex above and the subcortex and brainstem and hypothalamus below. So what are some of the things, and again, this is, uh, I think, very familiar to most people, uh, things that the limbic system is in involved with evolutionarily, from older animals on up, drive and emotion, memory. Uh, it's involved in acquiring and consolidating neocortical memories. It's not where the memories lie. It's not the bank itself. If you want to go to the bank of faces that you know, you go to the fusiform gyrus, that's where you store those faces. Take out the fusiform gyrus, you take out all your past awareness of faces, and even your ability to recognize faces is different. Um, but the limbic system, the hippocampus and related areas, are critical for imprinting the pattern on the neocortical areas that will learn. So without the hippocampus, short-term memory obviously becomes extremely difficult for neocortical activities. You can learn procedural things, like learning how to ride a bike without a hippocampus, because that involves more basal ganglia, cerebellar memories, and those things can, can be imprinted uh, without a hippocampus. I'll talk later about things that I think uh, probably don't receive enough attention, but novelty and familiarity. These, I think, are primary functions of limbic regions. So for example, I mentioned faces. And I think it's well known that if you have bilateral lesions in the fusiform, the gyrus, the inferior temporal lobe near the occipital border, uh, you will lose the ability to recognize faces. As part of that, you will you know, know that a face is a face, but you won't be able to tell my face from your own face, 
from another face unless you can pick out things like I've got a big nose or someone else has hairy ears or bushy eyebrows. That part you may be able to identify and obviously voice and other things. But the actual face itself you can't tell apart. And that ends up being somewhat uh, generalizable. So people with prosthetic that know that no car is a car but, but often can't tell a uh, Volkswagen Beetle from a Cadillac. Again, unless they start studying specific features and do some analytical work. But it's just quickly looking at it, what everyone in this room can do in a, in a millisecond or two, they just can't do after looking at it for five seconds. But that's where the faces are stored. There's a different region that actually has to do with the feeling of familiarity. And breakdown in the connection between recognition and familiarity is probably the basis in part for syndromes such as Capgras syndrome, where someone may, as my grandmother did, recognize that her essentially live-in husband uh, was Charlie, but she felt that Charlie was an imposter. Uh, and we'll come back to that. But she recognized the face. Her fusiform system was working, but the familiarity system was not working. So that the hippocampus, in many ways, um, again, we think of the cortex and evolution in a funny way. We, you know, we kind of get taught that there's a bottom region, <coughs> the brainstem, and then there's uh, a region that birds have, for example, that's uh, the, the uh, basal ganglia, and, and then there's the cortex, and there's the limbic system, uh, which evolved with the hippocampus, and then there's the neocortex, uh, which came into place with mammals, and then obviously took off in primates, etc. It turns out in the cortical hierarchy, another way to think about it is that every time the brain sees something, I mean, we start our life as a brain with sensory input, touch, visual, sound, and we, we come to recognize patterns. So the way the brain, we think, works in seeing things is by taking little parcels and putting them up together, kind of the way um, we look at things as well. So if you want to look at a picture, you take different pieces and then you keep synthesizing it together. Once you've learned, uh, for example, that a stick figure, figure represents a person, that gets recognized by a visual association cortex and you no longer need to think about that. But if you see something in the figure that you don't recognize, you bump it up to higher levels of visual cortex that get more engaged as there's a novelty. Because recognizing simple things that we know, the nervous system just keeps building on patterns and building on patterns and building on patterns. And once it learns patterns, those become rote and takes a lot, takes no uh, working memory for the brain and takes very little analytical memory. But when it sees patterns that are new, this could be a visual pattern, it can be a social scenario, it has to bump it up to some higher level. And in many ways, the hippocampus is the highest level in the neocortex. It's not in the neocortex, it's below it. But it is the highest level because that's, once it gets to novelty, you engage the hippocampal regions because it's not familiar and you need to start learning something because it is not something you've already learned. And that becomes an important part of, although the hippocampus is thought to be kind of down in the evolution, it's, it's well developed, almost as well developed in, um, in mice as it is in humans. It is much bigger in elephants um, than it is in humans, not just the fact that their brains are four times larger, but the hippocampi are way more than four times larger, um, and they do have large temporal lobes and good memory. But what's next door to the hippocampus is the parahippocampal cortex. The anterior portion uh, is specially uh, evolved on an fMRI and lesion studies, it's pretty clear, uh, for familiarity for faces. So the two things evolutionarily that are very, very important for us as primates and as early <coughs> humans is the recognition of faces and places. Those are two incredibly important things for primates. You need to know people in your emotion, in your group and people who are foreign. Again, you're, you're a chimpanzee, you're out on the fringe, you're a male, you're thinking maybe you'll find a female and have sex and um, spread your genes. But you need to, when you see a face, as soon as you can recognize, number one, is it someone you know? And is it someone, you know, if you do know them, who's likely going to do you good or bad? 
Um, that's an incredibly important evolutionary thing. And primates from way back before chimpanzees have developed specific areas of the brain to recognize faces and recognize very subtle changes in emotions on those faces, which is where most of the emotional expression occurs uh, in primates and humans. So that these areas of the brain, the fusiform and basal temporal regions are incredibly important for both recognition of faces and topographical memory, which involves both three-dimensional spatial routes as well as the ability of primates and humans to find landmarks. So some people are incredible navigators and they can just have a sense for where they're going. They just kind of keep an internal map of the world and they're able to do that remarkably well. And there are other people who, who can find landmarks and just remember there's a big church and you make a right, then you go down and you see the deli and you make a left, and, and they do it by landmark. And most of us use both of those techniques. There are some people who are terrible at both, and there are some people who are phenomenal at both. But we all use those systems, and those are in the basal temporal region. Um, it was shown in some of the studies that cab drivers in London who have to take an incredible test to pass the shortest route from point A to point B, um, have remarkably well-developed uh, fMRI activity in those regions. But that's learning and storing. The parahippocampal gyrus is where we encode familiarity. And that's kind of tied very strongly to emotion. Because what's familiar to you has a certain emotional valence, and what's novel has a certain appeal or interest. Um, and again, we'll come back to that later. Motivation, attention, and behavioral inhibition are all things, again, that are core living system functions. Well, I'm going to talk a fair amount about epilepsy and some of the ways that helped us understand the limbic system. And to begin with, seizures we know cause behavioral changes. But it's more complicated than I think most people think. When you have a seizure, when the brain is actively discharged, you can have either excitation, which is, I think, the intuitive concept most people have. My right motor cortex is firing off, and my left, my left hand has chronic jerking activity, and it's kind of a very easy concept to get. Probably much more common with seizures is that my right cortex is firing and my left hand is not working. We know if you fire off in Broca's area, you never, ever, ever get speech as far as we know from either artificial electrical stimulation of the brain or from spontaneous seizures. You get speech arrest. So in general, for the vast majority of times, seizures inhibit behavior. One of the problems is it's very hard to measure. If someone's sitting in bed and their hands are like this, and their legs are in bed just lying down, um, you don't know if their motor system shut off. And then you get to more complicated things that the frontal lobes and limbic systems do, like social functions. Um, how would you gauge a situation in which three boys and three girls were interacting Complex things like that are very, um, they're essentially impossible to assess at a bedside during a seizure and to separate that out from impaired consciousness. And I'll just digress here for a second because it's a theme I'll come back to. I think for most people, when they think about brains and functions, they don't do a good job at recognizing where we stand in biology. So the human species, as best we know, is about 100 to 125,000 years old. Uh, somewhere about 60,000 years ago, a relatively small group of black-skinned humans um, came out of Africa, mitochondrial Eve included, um, and then spread along the coast of uh, Arabia into India and into the Middle East and eventually into Europe. Um, those, are the, those are our forefathers. We as a species are 100,000 years old. We made the great leap forward, uh, so to speak, in our own social evolution with cave paintings, with combs, with burials of our dead, with fine harpoons, um, as opposed to just coarse, big stones that were carved a little bit for, for cutting meat and things like that. That great leap forward was 25, 30,000 years ago. Um, prior to that, all humans lived in hunter-gatherer societies that make current hunter-gatherer societies look very, very primitive. 
So to put it in another perspective, if someone came to this planet 50,000 years ago and wanted to survey intelligence of animals on the, on the globe, it is by no means clear that humans would come out first. Uh, if they just looked at brain size, then certainly whales and elephants, which have brains four or five times larger than ours, um, that probably have complex language, we just really have no idea. It's 1984 we figured out that elephants are communicating with low frequency vocalizations. That was Katie Payne, who was a whale researcher, who was at the Portland Zoo, and felt a strange vibration and realized that's exactly what she felt when she was in church by the organ. Um, and in 1984, we figured out elephants who we've uh, been, who worked for us for 3,000 years, um, were talking in a way we had no idea. Um, and for animals like whales, we just we interface with them for you know one tenth of one percent of their existence, uh, and we just have no idea what they're doing. So I think we have a sense of ourselves which is very artificial. We think of ourselves as reading and writing. Those are not evolutionary traits that we were made to have. Um, our brain, as Stephen Gould likes to talk about them, and other evolutionary systems may have the ability to do things that once required evolved for other things that got taken over, hijacked, or used for things like reading or writing, but certainly our brain never evolved for reading or writing. In the same way, in our society, we think, you know, why are kids kids for 16, you know, 15 or 16 years? And I think for most of us, you know, it's kind of where they grow up and we teach them, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Reading, writing, and arithmetic, never mind 10,000 years, for 99% of the human population, those functions are 200 or 300 years old. I mean, if you go back 400 years in human history and find out what percent of the population could read and write, it was less than 2% of the world's population. It was tiny. So that these are recent things, in our, you know, we think of them now as like what every kid does. Because that is what every kid does in New York City and in our regions around us. But go back 500 years in our own evolution, which really not too far, and almost nobody did. We're, but they were kids 50,000 years ago, as best we could tell, for 16 years as well. And the reason is, they were kids because they needed to learn social functions, and it was a duration of time for the brain to develop. I mean, big brains, for all their intuitive things that we know they're good for, they're good for memory, they're good for figuring out complex solutions to novel problems, they're good for a whole range of wonderful things, and we all love them. But very, very few species of mammals have ever evolved their brains. And the reason is that they're enormously costly. There are long gestational periods. I think elephants are like 22 months, humans are nine months. So a woman has to be supported during that time. Childhood is 16 years. Both the parent and the child are more vulnerable and require much higher food intake during that period. So there's just these enormous costs, and the brain is, is the big consumer in the body. You know, 2% of body weight, 25% of energy consumption. It's an amazingly expensive organ. Go back to 1900 and go to a graveyard. 20% of women died in childhood in 1900. It was a huge risk, and the reason was the human head evolved to the maximal size of the pelvic outlet for the female. And it evolved so big that it, it is just at the edge of what can be tolerable. So we need to kind of think about behavior in a much more evolutionary perspective, I think, and understand where we came from and probably have a little more humility. Neanderthal's brain was 150 to 200 cubic centimeters larger than ours. It is by no means for sure that Cro-Magnon and modern Homo sapiens uh, was smarter or better. We don't know what work led to Neanderthal dying. It could have been viral. Uh, could have been the fact that we had dogs and they didn't. We just don't know. But uh, I think it's worth, again, keeping the evolutionary side in mind. Let's turn back to epilepsy. When you have seizures, you have the activation and inhibition that can affect behavior, and then, like I said, many of which can be very hard to assess. And then you have the post ictal and inter periods. And they can, number one, blur into each other. And I would say that post ictal often predicts inter -ictal. So as the classic uh, example in epilepsy, which was recognized very well by people like Romberg in 1855, after seizures, you have terrible memory problems. Sometimes a tonic-clonic seizure 
go up to me five minutes later, give me three words, and there's zero chance that they will remember those three words, basically. Um, and that's post ictal Go to someone who's had 100 tonic-clonic seizures and test them a month after their last seizure, and I will bet you anything that their short-term memory is a standard deviation off impaired compared to their age and sex match control group, regardless of any medication they're on. So chronic seizures like head injuries impair brain function. They are not good for the brain. They may do other things, uh, but in general, the, the bigger the seizure and the longer it lasts, probably the more brain injury you get as a result of epilepsy. But it's not just memory. Um, attention, executive function, essentially anything the brain can do can be impaired by seizures, especially if the seizure focus is near that area of the brain. Uh, and then behavioral issues are, of course, legendary for people with chronic epilepsy. Depression can occur in 50%, major depression, <coughs> mania, uh, postictally, irritability, and psychosis. I just got um, written to by a reporter from <coughs> somewhere upstate New York, I'm uh, blocking on the town, but it was a man who killed his wife in a postictal state. Uh, and that's not the first time I've, I've heard that. I take care of a man. Uh, who did a similar thing and actually met him when he was in a, in a state prison, uh, having been convicted of murder, basically he had seizures. Guy came to him and essentially told him to kill his wife, and he did, and he stabbed himself but didn't kill himself. Uh, he eventually had a right temporal lobectomy, became seizure-free, got you know, while he was in prison, he had a surgery, you know, we brought him in, there were guards there, um, and served out his prison term, is now off meds, working, um, and has a fair amount of insight, you know, kind of has a vague recollection of God having come to him and having had this happen. Uh, he remembers killing his wife, he's been married now. Um, and he's, he's a perfectly lovely man. But, um, you know, this is occasionally what seizures can do. And the religious phenomena here is not so rare. A lot of people after a cluster of seizures develop profound behavioral changes, uh, including religious ideation, as well as psychosis. Uh, and some of those people can undergo religious conversions, and, and sometimes in more lucid ways, too. So there's a woman I care for, or was involved with her care when I was in medical school, who graduated number one in her class at a very prestigious university, um, who was dating an incredibly uh, well-known <coughs> musician, and it had, uh, unbeknownst to her, from a motorcycle accident a couple of years before, had simple partial seizures, but never recognized what they were. And probably had some complex partial seizures as well. One day, God came to her and told her to run for Congress. And she did. She ran for US Congress. And I don't want to give too much detail. It's a long time ago, but it was in Massachusetts. And she ran. There were pictures of her in the paper with a priest saying God told her to do it. And she lost by, she ran in the opposite party because she couldn't get the nomination in the party that had always won that district. She ran whatever it was, as a Republican, I think, and ended up losing by like 2% of the vote. She never went to run again. But it just shows you in these, in these conditions that you can get supernormal phenomena. So I'm going to turn back again historically um, and look at some of the cases that molded our modern thinking about epilepsy and behavior. The first case is Dr. Z, uh, a really remarkable patient uh, who's been written about a bit. Uh, Dr. Z died from a floral hydrate overdose, committed suicide, and Eulings Jackson happened to live, and not coincidentally, at the house next door to him. Um, Jackson was there shortly after death, uh, got the body transported to the National Hospital, and begged Coleman, who was an orthopedologist, to um, dissect the brain and look for a lesion near the case center since when Dr. Z had his episodes, he was described as having tasting movements uh, during his complex partial seizures. Uh, Coleman found a small focus of softening in the left uncus, and this is the origin of the term unsnid epilepsy, one of the truly first descriptions of temporal lobe epilepsy. What's remarkable is that Jackson had seen this man since 1877, so he followed him for 17 years. Uh, Dr. Myers was a physician, uh, his brother, um, Arthur Myers, was actually one of the founders of the British Society for Psychical Research, a very close friend of uh, William James, uh, who'd been to America, and James had been to visit him in England many times. Uh, a remarkable family of poets and scholars, 
Uh, and Dr. Z wrote his first paper uh, under a pseudonym Warrens, I think from British Medical Journal, and described his deja vu episodes. And essentially said, I know a lot of normal people get deja vu, but I get this feeling, and I've had it for a lot for a long time, and all of a sudden I had it, and I had a convulsive seizure, so I think it's related to the epilepsy. And that was the original tie between uh, partial epilepsy and deja vu uh, as a symptom. So he developed complex partial seizures, but those, again, were not originally described by Jackson. They were described before by several French uh, and German authors. But this case, in many ways, was one, uh, I know people like to talk about Freud as someone who started his life in neurology um, and then eventually went to psychiatry and cut the knot between those two places. But Ewling's Jackson, in this case, probably did as much as Freud to help separate neurology and psychiatry. Um, here was this case that he probably, without question, studied more intensively than any other case in his career, moved next to the guy, so he would be available to observe him and study him and potentially get the brain if he died. Um, but when he wrote about it, he focused solely on the neurologic problems. This is a man who had a terribly significant depression, had a lot of behavioral changes that are present in his diaries and some of his letters to his family. But Ewing's Jackson essentially ignored all of the behavioral stuff. And Ewing's Jackson was not naive to psychiatry. He used to go and attend at the West Riding Lunatic Asylum um, and wrote many of his incredible papers that uh, neurologic disease will be the model for understanding psychiatric illness. But somehow in this case, his most important one that probably provided some of the nicest proof that he could have used to, to write about he totally dissociated uh, the neurologic aspects from the behavioral aspects. So there was meticulous detail of the epilepsy, every feature, you know, there are many, many of his papers describe Dr. Z, um, but there's a total lack of biographical behavioral features of any description of his uh, suicide. So we move forward in time, this is 1951, and Gibbs, who was at Harvard at the time, an electroencephalographer, made the observation that the Sylvian Fisher is one of the chief boundaries between neurology and psychiatry. Um, obviously, he was being loose in this discussion, but when you look at patients with epilepsy who have severe personality disorder, if you have a temporal lobe focus, you know, it's very high anterior temporal, which is more amygdala region than the hippocampus. Uh, Mid-temporal, it comes down, but as you go to other areas of the brain, it, it falls off under 10%. In the same way, if you look at total psychiatric disorders, you see a very similar, if not exaggerated, thing, and this is from a later paper. The patient's emotional reactions to his seizures, to his family, to his social situation, are less important determinants of psychiatric disorder than the site and type of the epileptic discharge. So again, you know, people back at the turn of the century, the early 1900s, very much recognized, and it was much, much worse then than it is now for people with epilepsy. They were stigmatized, they were put in colonies, they were sent away from their families. It was an embarrassment. You didn't talk about it. It could affect your brother's and sister's marriage potential, which it still does in the Hasidic community in Brooklyn. Um, so those things were very real things, and epilepsy was terribly stigmatized. And yet Gibbs recognized, beyond all that stigma, beyond all the social problems, um, there's a true issue. Because some of these patients with frontal lobe epilepsy or occipital epilepsy have just as many seizures and just as intense seizures as those with anterior temporal lobe foci. But somehow, it's the ones with the anterior temporal lobe foci who have a much higher rate of psychiatric disorder. And in you know, part, I don't think this slide should be emboldened in your mind, uh, because I think these graphs would probably be different with modern diagnosis and classification. But his basic point is right. There are certain areas of the brain that are related to behavior. And when you have seizures in those areas, behavior is abnormal. It's not a surprise. So Henry Gasteau from Lennox Gasteau Syndrome, who was a French uh, epileptologist in 1954, uh, conceived the temporal lobe interrectal behavioral syndrome as the unclue for Busey syndrome. Uh, Kluver and Busey were uh, neurologists and neurosurgeon physiologists back in the 30s in Chicago who recognized when you take out the anterior temporal lobes of rhesus monkeys that they get a constellation of features. They are distractible, uh, they're hypersexuals, males bound to other males, they masturbate all the time. Uh, they didn't do the experiments. Kluver and Busey never did their experiments in females. 
Uh, there's a lot of increased uh, environmental exploration, a lot of oral behavior, uh, they put everything in their mouth, and they did become hyperphagic and obese eventually. In their later papers, they described that. And they also have a loss of fear and aggression. So these rhesus monkeys that were caged, um, which were a nightmare for the uh, handlers to get the monkey and not get bit, and have to wear thick gloves and uh, uniform, you know, out padded outfits so they wouldn't get bit in the neck. Um, these animals lost that, that fear reaction completely. In contrast, in temporal lobe epilepsy, that he described viscosity, which had been around for a long time, and that is the trait. Um, which I don't think we don't understand 100% what it is, but it's probably some combination of a need for increased social interaction. I mean, Norman Gessman used to talk about this all the time, and one day I was watching give uh, you know professors rounds at the Boston VA where Edith Kaplan was, and it was a wonderful session. It was, you know, Benson was there, all these great figures who emerged in behavioral neurology were all sitting around in the same room. And this woman, middle-aged woman, came in, brought in by a resident with temporal lobe epilepsy, and Geshwin interviewed her and went over a lot of her features. Um, and then she was leaving after about a half-hour interview, and she leaves, she walks through the door at the VA in the little conference room, and then Geshwin goes, hmm? puts his hand up for no one to speak to us. She comes back in. I have one more question, Dr. Geshwin. And um, it was that tendency, and then you know, it was another 10 minutes before he could get her out. Um, that tendency for prolonged interaction, some of it is related to difficulty with word finding, so people take longer to get words out. But a lot of it, I think, is more of this social thing. And I think we all know people like this on the phone, where once they start sort of speaking, it's a question, how do you get them off the phone? Um, but, you know, it's a uh, trait that definitely occurs in some epilepsy patients, probably with more left-sided activity. Decreased sexual interest has been well documented. Um, again, often doesn't bother the patient. It's more something the parents notice or a spouse will complain about, uh, but often just lack of interest in sexual activity. Um, overall, tend to be hypoactive gasto identified. But they would sometimes shift, often after a seizure, to a phase of manic increased activity for a short time. And again, um, many times they could be irritable and aggressive. I don't think this is a universal trait. I think this has probably gotten better in the modern era of anti-epileptic drugs. This is back in 1954. And you're looking at dilantin without dilantin levels. I can't imagine what that was like. Because for those of you who know, most drugs have a um, linear pharmacokinetics, but dilantin has zero order kinetics. So it basically it starts off slow and titrates linearly down to a blood level of like 12 and then it just takes off. So you can raise dilantin, you know, you can be on 300 milligrams of dilantin and have a blood level of 12, go to 400 and have a level of 32, and the patient's toxic. So, you know, in modern days, if you know what you're doing, you can get blood levels, it's really quite easy. I can't imagine what it was like in 1954. So again, they basically had dilantin, phenobarbital, and bromides, really toxic drugs. Um, and some of these problems may have been related to those. And then there's a, another patient, um, who I think has received very little attention. Geshwin used to talk about it. I think he profoundly influenced Geshwin's thoughts on the syndrome. But it was the, uh, I refer to him as the safety pin man, a beautiful paper written by uh, Mitchell Faulkner and Hill and Lancet in 1954. Such papers would be illegal now since they're case reports. They don't take them in the major journals. But it was a 38 year old man admitted for psychosis. He was grandiose, paranoid, and religious. Um, and he described to the resident who did the intake a curious pleasure when he looked at safety pins. And indeed, it turned out that from when he was a child, he learned that if he could look at safety pins, he would get this wonderful feeling, which as he hit puberty, uh, would go all the way to an orgasm with climax. Uh, the brighter the safety pin, the better, and the more numerous the safety pins, the better. So as you can imagine, he walked around with a pocket full of safety pins. Um, <laughs> He realized that this was not something everyone else probably did, so he kept it to himself and he did it in private. Uh, he served in World War II in the British Army, was honorably discharged. Uh, afterwards, he got married, but he was disappointed to find out sex with his wife was much less enjoyable than sex with a safety pin. Um, and he eventually became impotent uh, with his wife, but could only have an erection and an orgasm when looking at a safety pin or even thinking about a safety pin. One day, his wife walked in on him uh, when he was in a room, 
and noticed a very strange look on his face. Following this, he was confused. He had actually <coughs> had an orgasm, had a complex partial seizure. And then, interestingly, he insisted on putting on his wife's clothing, which he did. He was in a post state and was confused. He got admitted, and as Geshman likes to say, you know, had he been admitted to any hospital in the United States, he just would have been put on a ward and given some psychiatric medications. But this was uh, at the Maudsley, and they had a very good integration of neurology and psychiatry. And the first thing they did is said, this is very unusual for a psychiatric illness. Let's get an EEG. And he was found to have left temporal nerve spikes. And he had a classic seizure reported, because they were frequent, by having him look at the safety pin. He had a left temporal lobectomy, uh, and his satisfaction and fascination with safety pins were gone. Uh, and he, again, had normal potency with his wife. So a remarkable story of, uh, of what can happen with probably conditioning at some point, together with a seizure. And for Geshwin, um, he liked to say, if you just took this case at first glance, you could never think this would be an organic case. If you just described a lot of the features of someone <coughs> looking at a safety pin, having an orgasm, then wanting to dress up as a woman, um, you wouldn't have to look too hard to find psychological um, factors that might be motivating that patient. But he argued that learning, um, and learning random things, there may have happened to have been a safety pin nearby when he had his first seizure, and it may have been a seizure that comes from areas of the brain that have to do with sexual function. Um, he eventually became hyposexual with his wife, which is common for epilepsy. And when he was admitted, he was horribly psychotic, which could get better in his case with the temporal epidemic. But Geshman argued, and I'm not sure it's right, but it's an interesting theory, that random reinforcement of the amygdala um, can give rise to feelings of fear or feelings of altered behavior without any logical cause. It's one thing if people yell at you or, or mean to you and you feel, you feel threatened and sad, that would be normal. But imagine what it's like when you have paroxysmal episodes of fear that come out of the blue um, randomly in your life, you have no idea, and you start to associate random things with the fear, um, and it's been shown people who have fear orders do have much higher rates of psychopathology among temporal lobe epilepsy patients. So there probably is something to that having recurrent fear for no reason um, probably does predispose your mind towards uh, personality changes. So Geshwin, I think as a lot of people know, uh, during the 70s wrote a series of papers with Steve Waxman, David Baer, and others on behavioral changes, not during seizures, not after seizures, but between seizures, during the interictal period in people with temporal lobe epilepsy. For one, he said, the personality changes are not always pathologic. We should think of them as changes, not good or bad, uh, but as changes. In general, most of them are pathological and are bad. But some of them, like the religious phenomena that I discussed before, the woman who ran for Congress, um, would be hard to say is purely bad. Um, she was a bright woman who basically became inspired to do something um, very difficult and got incredibly close to doing it. A lot of these individuals have increased emotionality, which is one of the reasons why they're almost never thrown out by their families, because they form very strong emotional and social bonds with those who love them and who they love. Uh, circumstantiality, which is talking around the point of viscosity I touched on. Hyposexuality, increased religious and moral concerns. Again, this is one of those fascinating <coughs> lessons of not only what uh, epilepsy can do in the brain, but about doctors and how we take history. So for most uh, neurologists, including myself, uh, if you see an epilepsy patient, it's a new patient, you have a 45-minute or a one-hour slot, you know, you have to go through cause the epilepsy, about the birth history, febrile seizures, head trauma, uh, go over the history of when seizures began, what was the seizure life when it began at age eight, what did it change into, what medicines were you treated, what was the response, what's your past medical history, get a good description of the seizure. By the time you do all that, you know, if you need to explain the medications or the testing you're going to do, you know, you're lucky if you can get in in the 45 minutes or hour. So how do you start to ask the patient difficult questions like, has there been a change in your um, religious or moralistic feelings? And that's where the old-fashioned system where Geshman lived, where you, know, you spend three or four hours with a patient, was a beautiful thing, and he would identify this. 
He once gave a grand rounds uh, with the patient again at Mass Mental Hospital when it was still uh, open and subsequently closed its doors. But there was a 16-year-old Jewish male who came in from a suburb uh, who had epilepsy and was presented by the resident. And the resident who read up and knew what Geshem was going to be asking. Um, and at one point, Geshem said, so is, is this young man uh, have excessive religious concerns? And the resident said, no. Geshem said, did you check? And the resident said, yes, I did check it. He said, no. So Geshem turned to the young guy, 16 or 17, and, and said, uh, do you have strong religious feelings? And he said, no. And Geshem said, why not? He goes, because my damn rabbi is not religious enough. He, and he just he went into my head out of my brain on the fact that the rabbi fails to grasp you know, the core messages of Judaism and had incredibly deep thoughts about it. But when you asked him, his first answer was no. So the superficial glide over the problem uh, was no. But if you delved in, and Geshem was a master of this. So again, even in those cases where people did do their diligence, they often missed what was lying underneath. In the same way, with moral concerns, the point Geshem made was, you know, obviously all of us, I suspect most of, a, of an intellectual group that's sitting in this room thinks about death and life and religion and, and fate and causality and things like that, and, you know, read philosophy books. But what Geshman found remarkable is when you get a construction worker who left school in 10th grade um, and is, is bringing in, you know, Wittgenstein, um, and it only happened, you know, two years after his epilepsy began, that that is a truly remarkable behavioral change. This is, you don't expect, you know, a construction worker who, you know, basically couldn't have taken his SATs to start coming in with higher level philosophy books. Um, it just, he was a change that clearly he recognized and is not present in 20% or 80%, but it's present in five or 7% of these patients. But when it's present, it's an incredibly remarkable feature. Another trait that he described, which I think has received you know, a moderate amount of attention is hypergraphia. You don't see hypergraphia in a few places. Mania is probably uh, the most common place where people become hypergraphic, and some great novelists and writers um, have been hypergraphic. Um, epilepsy patients, again, probably in more of the 5 or 7% range, it's usually temporal lobe epilepsy. It's usually right temporal lobe epilepsy, which interestingly gives you more mania than left temporal lobe epilepsy, so that may be a biological overlap there. Um, and the, the most famous hypergraphic temporal lobe epilepsy patient was Dostoevsky. Um, who writes about, has an epilepsy character in every novel he wrote. Uh, many of them are the lead characters in books like The Idiot uh, and Brothers Karamazov. Uh, and they play incredibly important roles. Uh, Dostoevsky wrote to his brother that when he had seizures, when he had numbers of seizures, he often would write more and write better than he would write at other times. Um, and described in, I think it's The, uh, the Idiot, what it's like to get a religious order. And he describes, you know, for the felicity of this moment, I would give a year of, no, the entirety of my lifetime to know what this is like. And this is exactly what Muhammad experienced uh, when God came to him as well, because Muhammad was an epileptic. Uh, and that's, you know, paraphrasing Dostoevsky. But that is, that was an ictal aura that he had uh, of a religious feeling. And if you go to books, um, some of the classic books on religion, you find that uh, many authors have recognized there's one disease that stands out among all the neurologic and psychiatric illnesses uh, for religious figures in world history, and that is epilepsy. Um, so that many of the people who have affected religious groups have had epilepsy, some of whom, like Muhammad, have, have founded religions, and uh, there's a fair amount of literature on this. And then finally, aggressiveness, again, not typical or common in most patients, but when it occurs, it can be fairly dramatic as that case, uh, which was post uh, of the man I described earlier. So Paul uh, Fedio and David Baer, uh, who were colleagues of Dr. Geshwin, described these in red, which you can't read, I already went over, so that's okay. Uh, they went through the literature and found additional traits, philosophical interest, personal <coughs> destiny, obsessionalism, dependence, elation, anger, and compared a group of uh, epilepsy patients and controls and found essentially that all 18 traits rated by both the patient as well as a proxy, a spouse, a parent, 
um, that in all 18 traits, people with temporal lobe epilepsy came out higher. Now, without going into the literature too much, there's a lot of controversy about this. There's no doubt, I think, it is higher in epilepsy patients versus a, uh, a group of John and Jane Doe's on the street. But if you take other epilepsy patients, if you take other neurologic disorders that affect the brain, uh, it's hard to find significant increases. And this is where I think Geshwin was in some ways at his best, because the question is, what makes a syndrome? And when we think about a syndrome, uh, we often think about some group of features. But it does raise, I think, an important question in medicine of how you define a syndrome. And as an example, there was an article written by Peck, I believe, P-L-E-C-K, in Cortex somewhere in the late 70s or early 80s on Gertzmann syndrome, which doesn't exist. Now, Gertzmann syndrome was described by Gertzmann, a neurologist, uh, with, associated with left inferior parietal lobe, injury to the brain, and finger agnosia, right-left confusion, acalculia, agraphia. and agraphia. Thank you. So all four features were occurring with lesions to that area. And many people accepted it as a syndrome. And then Peck took a large group of patients, I forget the details, but a couple hundred patients for whom he did careful neuropsychological cognitive testing, and started doing correlations. You know, if you do agraphia with uh, topographic disorientation, you get a certain P, you know, correlation of 0.15. If you do agraphia with uh, finger agnosia, you get 0.13. And he did, you know, he did like 50 different things and cross-correlated them, and the ones in Gertzmann syndrome had no greater correlations with each other, like right-left disorientation and agraphia, than they did with all these other random things like anomia and memory impairment and others. And from that, he said, you know, there really is no Gertzmann syndrome. You can take any of these features and say, yeah, you know, you can see these four together, and I can write up five patients where I saw these four things together, but it's just kind of an artifact. And so I remember in Boston one day, I was at Geshen's home, and we were talking about a paper I had written, and he did that, and had a few beers, and we were sitting there, and we went over this, and he said, did you ever see that paper? I said, yes. He goes, what do you think of it? I said, I think it makes good sense. He goes, well, it's wrong. Why is it wrong? And I remember sitting there with the beer swirling around in my brain, and all I could say was think, which wasn't helping me at all. Um, and he said, the answer is, or if if someone came into the hospital and had a low uh, potassium, or I should say a low sodium and a high potassium, and a low cortisol level and darkening of their skin, uh, what would you say? And I said, I'd say it's Addison's disease. He goes, exactly. He goes, so if you go into the hospital and you do a correlation of sodium level and, and skin pigmentation, what kind of association do you get? I said, we're well, going to see a lot of black people and it's going to depend on what their sodium is going to do. There's exactly. There's going to be no correlation. Does that mean Addison's disease doesn't exist? Of course not. That's the wrong thing. What makes a syndrome a syndrome is the fact that these, these things that normally don't have any correlation with each other, that's exactly the point. Things that don't correlate with each other all of a sudden appear at the same time in the same place together. Uh, and that's why I think Gerstmann syndrome is a real syndrome. And it is truly associated with only one lesion area in the brain, the left inferior parietal cortex. You can get all those things in isolation or with other things in other lesions of the brain. But if you see those four things together, the left inferior parietal lobule has almost got to be involved in the lesion. And Geshwin used that same argument here. He said, listen, everything on the list I don't disagree with. And because these are behavioral changes, I predict they're going to all be higher in psychiatric patients. I predict they're going to all be higher patients with Alzheimer's, patients with multiple sclerosis. That's not the point. You show me a patient who's hypergraphic, who's hyper-emotional, who's viscous, who's got hyposexuality. Um, you put all those four things together, and there are just not a lot of things that are going to cause that. And I think he's right. I think, unfortunately, he got misinterpreted by a lot of people who see one or two features and say it must be temporal lobe epilepsy. And I think that's dangerous because these features are very prevalent in a large number of neuropsychiatric disorders. Some are relatively specific, but even hypergraphia, like I said, you'll probably think of mania before you think of epilepsy, but there are not a whole lot of things that cause people to be hypergraphic. Yet when they are hypergraphic, it's remarkable. Some of his original patients 
when he, they said they write a lot, he said, I'd love to see your writing. And he said, they said, do you want me to bring it all in? He goes, oh yeah, bring it all in. I'd like to see it all. They came in with one of the dollies and cartons with their diary. And most of them were not like Dostoevsky. The vast majority were not. <laughs> the vast majority were writing, you know, I woke up at 11.14, um, went to the bathroom, you know, my wife called me just underlining things, you know, and then she said this and she shouldn't have, you know, underlining shouldn't have four times, and then taking a yellow marker and putting it through there. So they were kind of obsessed with details about themselves. There's kind of this inability to separate themselves from the rest of the world and the importance, the relative importance about what they're writing about. So one of Geshwin's mentors, when he was in Queen Square studying in the uh, late 1950s, was a Dr. Charles Simons, who's a remarkable figure in neurology. Simons was the first person when he was visiting with Barbara Cushing at the Brigham to identify a very aneurysm before death. Someone had a horrendous headache and became unconscious. And Dr. Simons at the time said to Harvey Cushing that this patient, I believe, has a very aneurysm. And Cushing said, that can't be. And Simon said, why not? He said, well, that's a pathological diagnosis. That is never a clinical diagnosis. And Simon said, well, I think it can be a clinical diagnosis. And he was right. So he was in a master position. He was the head of the RAF uh, medical unit during World War II and, and described a huge range of uh, psychological issues in pilots and what led to them and what didn't. You know, it was just a, a brilliant figure, again, straddling the behavioral as well as the neurologic side of the world. And this is a quote I'll read you that he said after Slater and Beer wrote what was a seminal paper uh, in 61, 62 on psychosis and epilepsy. They looked at the whole London catchment area uh, for psychiatric hospitalizations and got the number of people who were admitted with psychosis who had epilepsy and compared it to the frequency in the London area in general for the population and found that it was dramatically elevated. People with epilepsy have markedly higher rates of psychosis, which has subsequently been validated quite well. Um, and in their uh, histories, they found temporal lobe epilepsy was specifically correlated with the psychosis. So Simons was one of the discussants of that paper when it was presented. And he, he offered us a theory of what's going on in the brain that I think uh, is as insightful as anything since. Neither the fits nor the temporal lobe damage can be held directly responsible for psychosis because it wasn't seizure frequency, it wasn't the pathology as best it could find. So what's the link? Epileptic seizures and epileptic form discharges in the EEG are epiphenomenal, occasional expressions of a fundamental and continuous disorder of neuronal function. From moment to moment, there may be excess of either excitation or inhibition or even both at the same time. The epileptogenic disorder of function may be assumed to be present continuously but with peaks at which seizures are likely to occur. And I think he nailed it. I mean, I think the way we need to think of, of epilepsy is that seizures are the tip of the tip of the iceberg. Epileptic, epileptiform activity on the EEG are tips of the iceberg. And neuronal dysfunction, which is always present, um, is the base. So if you take a depth electrode and stick it into the hippocampus of someone with mesial temporal sclerosis, you will find abnormal neuronal function 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. It's always abnormal. And that's why, number one, there's memory impairment. Uh, so the brain in, in individuals with epilepsy, especially with certain forms where there are scar tissues, for example, like mesial temporal sclerosis, is going to be partially dysfunctional all the time. Uh, and we tend to think of epilepsy, which it is, as a paroxysmal disorder but we ignore the continuous nature of behavioral and cognitive and neuronal dysfunction in people with epilepsy. So what are some of the changes that occur? And Geshwin posited that there are progressive changes in the limbic system secondary to seizure foci. Baer uh, and Baer and Fedio suggested that epileptic form foci in the limbic system cause new connections uh, between neocortical and limbic regions leading to a so-called sensory limbic hyperconnection or hyperfunctionality uh, that is responsible for a lot of the behavioral changes that you see. Again, the brain is a wonderful learning machine. You know, if you meet a patient once and five years pass, I don't know, maybe better than me, but I won't remember their face, certainly not their name again. But if I see them every two months for three years and then they move to the West Coast and I happen to be in a store where they're at two years later, 
I will immediately wreck it, having met them 15 times. Um, their face, their voice, their motor patterns, their family history, you know, their medical history will be embedded in my mind. I'll be able to bring it up pretty quickly. We learn by reinforcing those connections, which are the patterns I discussed before. The same thing happens with epilepsy. When you have a seizure, certain groups of neurons fire synchronously together. And from what Edelman and everyone else knows about brain function, those areas, you know, as Hebb said back in the 50s, you know, the, the nerve cells that fire together wire together. So as you have more firings together, as you have more seizures, those circuits wire together, become stronger, and as Gower said, seizures can beget seizures, probably through that mechanism. So I'm going to turn now to a couple more case histories, one of which I already foreshadowed a fair amount, George Gershwin and the other one, Peter Dostoevsky. George Gershwin, um, in 1923, at age 25, wrote Rhapsody of Blue, uh, Rhapsody in Blue. He had sudden onset of bouts of abdominal pain and later depression. He was seen by, he started, I think, in New York, uh, saw a lot of physicians in New York City, went to Boston for diagnosis, to the Lady Clinic, went to the Mayo Clinic, he eventually moved to LA and saw a whole bevy of doctors there. Did every GI test, including various swallows and examinations, kept a meticulous diary of everything he ate, because he was convinced that was what was causing the abdominal pain. Got diagnosed as anxiety neurosis, composer stomach, uh, underwent analysis and psychiatric care for most of his life. And in 1936, when living in LA, he began to develop hallucinations of smell and had several episodes of staring, which were witnessed. One while giving a piano concert, um, he was interrupted, and then he was able to resume the piano performance in LA. Um, and shortly after this, he was taken to a neurologist who heard the history and the fact that it occurred in a large auditorium with people watching and said this confirms uh, you know, composure stomach and anxiety neurosis, it's all psychogenic in origin. Uh, and then, uh, uh, and that was actually um, in 1937, and about a week after he saw that neurologist, he herniated from a right temporal lobe glioblastoma and died. So without much question, his simple partial seizures had been present for a long time, um, went unrecognized, which is still common. If all people get is abdominal pain and if paroxysmal, um, very few internists or GI physicians you know, we'll put epilepsy high on the list. Um, in the same way with panic disorder, if it's brief, if it's 10 seconds or two minutes, epilepsy should be somewhere on the differential diagnosis. You know, panic builds up slowly and lasts for 20 or 30 minutes. You know, the chances of epilepsy are infinitely small as the cause of that symptom. Uh, but if it's sudden onset, has no environmental provocative stimulus, and is brief in duration, epilepsy should definitely be one of the considerations it should have been, unfortunately, in, Gersh in Gershwin's case. Clearly today, if he'd been diagnosed in his uh, 20s, he probably would have survived. Dostoevsky, I described before, but uh, it's worth going into him in more detail because he was just such a, uh, a beautiful documenter of his own problem. He had ecstatic orders, as I described, the atonic-clonic seizures, and postictally, he would always be afraid of committing a monstrous crime. And wrote about this in his books and wrote about it in his personal letters. He had all or most of the Geshwin traits. He, and you just need to pick up a biography of him and get one third through it, and you'll see all this. But he was irritable. He was incredibly intense. Um, he had a deep sense of personal destiny. He was preoccupied with philosophical and moral issues. He was completely humorous. He was hy hyposexual. When his daughter wrote a biography about him, uh, she commented that it was so strange he did not have a mistress, um, which I think for the time and place he lived was an unusual thing. He would get in petty disputes when he was in the Sistine Chapel. Uh, these were things Geshwin used to talk about endlessly, but uh, Dostoevsky took a stool so he could step up and get a better look at the ceiling. Seems a little foolish. Uh, but the guard there insisted that he's not allowed to do that, and he, he basically said, I'm here, I'm at the Sistine Channel. Chapel, I demand, you know, and essentially had to get escorted out of there. Uh, he did become a compulsive gambler as well, so had some compulsiveness, and of course, was hypergraphic. Uh, he did get paid in that time for every page he wrote, so it may not have been a pure uh, brain hypergraphia, but remarkably, he, he was uh, notorious for when he was in the, in the zone to produce a lot. 
So what are some of the arguments that have been raised? Because, because the whole issue of the temporal lobe behavioral syndrome has received a lot of controversy, and a lot of people kind of, there's been so much written, so much controversy, a lot of uh, epileptologists and neuropsychiatrists don't know where it stands. Well, number one, there's the whole historical origins. I think there's a lot, as you saw in the quote from, from Gibbs, a sensitivity to the fact that people with epilepsy have had a hard time, especially 50 years ago from society, and there were sterilization laws that were only erased in the books of some US states for people with epilepsy in the 1970s. So um, people with epilepsy have truly had a, a difficult road. The behavioral changes are very pleomorphic. It's not like uh, everyone comes in looking like Dostoyevsky or looking like that 16-year-old boy in mass mental health. Um, there's a wide range. The temporal lobe is a big place. Um, other areas like the frontal lobe can be involved, other subcortical regions get involved. So it depends a lot on the genetics, it depends a lot on the person's environmental and social background, and it depends a lot on the specific seizure focus and the qualities of it. How often does it, does it discharge? How many lifetime kind of chronic seizures? All these variables play into the biology of what happens. There's also the issue of specificity for epilepsy. As I said, if you look at the 18 traits of Berenfedio, it's not that any, any one of them, or any two of them, are close to pathognomonic for temporal lobe epilepsy. They are not. You can see them in MS, you can see them in Alzheimer's, you can see them in mania, you can see them in schizophrenia. Indeed, I think, from my early career, one of the most uh, incredible things I did was have, have translations of Preplin's and Boiler's book on dementia precox. And if you read those books, the acute symptoms of schizophrenia look like, you know, you took a chapter out of a modern textbook of simple partial seizures of temporal lobe epilepsy. So people with schizophrenia in their early phases with their positive symptoms, you know, can get all of these traits making the specificity dif difficult. Uh, and Bob Post at the NIMH together with, I think it was uh, Silverman, Silverberg, did a paper on paroxysmal psychomotor psychosensory phenomena uh, in epilepsy and, psych and affective disorder patients written in the 80s. And in that paper, they basically went to the two wards. They went to the affective disorder ward, which is on the fourth floor of the NI, each clinical center, and they went to the, to the epilepsy ward, which is on the fifth floor, and they gave out the same questionnaires, asking how often you get paroxysmal deja vu, how often you get a religious feeling, how often you get a stomach feeling that rises up. And the bottom line, no difference in the frequency of those paroxysmal, paroxysmal phenomena between the affective disorders group, which included Bipolar, depression, bipolar disorder and unipolar depression, and the temporal lobe epilepsy. So these symptoms, in and of themselves, those are ictal symptoms, but the interictal ones are also not specific. It is, as I said, the, the concatenation, the combination of those symptoms, which is so key to, to raise the question to diagnosis. And then there are things like the specific, specificity within epilepsy. Is it really temporal lobe epilepsy? How about frontal lobe epilepsy? How about generalized epilepsy? And again, as Geshwin said, you know, I expect these things to be raised in all people with epilepsy, because all of them have disorders affecting the brain, and the brain controls behavior. So you're going to see behavioral changes in all epilepsy syndromes in a certain percentage of the population. And indeed, one of the best studies that looked at the bare fedio inventory in patients who had depth electrodes, kind of the gold standard of what we can look at, um, the frontal lobe epilepsy patients had just as high a rate of endorsing those traits as the temporal lobe epilepsy patients did. Uh, generalized epilepsy patients also have higher rates. They are different, though. The, the profiles are different. So I think just looking at numbers of symptoms or specific correlations, you probably won't see things statistically significant. And in some ways, that's a bit like Gertzmann syndrome. I, I think the devil is in looking at specific combinations. So, Generalized epilepsy, which is common in adults and even more common in kids, uh, is something that I think does not get looked at as carefully as it might. And this is a series of NYU with 37 patients with juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, one of the classic uh, generalized epilepsy syndromes, and nearly half had a history of psychiatric disorders for which they had been um, either sought psychiatric care or taken psychiatric medications. Uh, and depression was high, panic disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, conversion, non-epileptic seizures, and other conversion disorders uh, in one patient. So a fairly high rate of psychiatric morbidity in this group that is considered relatively, you know, non, which is non-temporal low. But again, 
temporal lobe dis does discharge as well as the frontal lobe in generalized epilepsy patients. This is a paper by Elaine Morell, who was in, up in Nova Scotia at the time, is now at the, the Mayo Clinic. But Elaine gave a, uh, a survey of behavioral functions and problems that occurred in children. It's very nice in Nova Scotia. They have this kind of captive population. If you grow up there, you largely stay there 15 years later. So they looked at patients with absence epilepsy, which I always learned was the most benign form of epilepsy. These are kids who just stare into space for five or 10 seconds. Um, they're supposed to be cognitively and behaviorally normal, and the majority of them outgrow their epilepsy. So what could be better than that? And they compared them to 61 patients with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. They wanted to find some control group that wasn't the brain, but would control for stigma, for medical treatment, for, for drug treatment. These are kids who often miss school, who have pain, uh, who get put on courses of steroids and pain medication. So, you know, it's not a brain disorder, but it's not a great thing to have in childhood. And the bottom line is patients with absence epilepsy had increased academic, personal, and behavioral disorders, everything from missing grades in school to teenage pregnancy, than those with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Not surprisingly, those who continued to have seizures when they were followed up about 15 years later had higher rates of all those problems than the others. But even those whose seizures stopped five years earlier did have higher rates than the JRA patients. So again, I think we often uh, underplay what we tell patients with epilepsy about how the parents about how the disorder will affect them. I think it's much easier for doctors uh, when they're asked, will a seizure be bad for my brain, to say, oh no, not at all, it's fine. You know, no, no problem, you'll bounce back. And the truth is, you know, if anyone in this group or myself had a single tonic-clonic seizure, it would be horrible. We'd be, you know, our memory would be affected for a few days or a week, but we probably would bounce back 99 plus 0.9%. Uh, the problem is when you start getting recurrent seizures over time, and especially in childhood, which is when the window of uh, learning and plasticity is greatest, that you may suffer some of the greatest deficits. 